Alpha 4. Why and how should I pray? Good place to go is to Matthew 6, when Jesus teaches us how to pray. First of all, he gives us a negative picture of that and then invites us into a deeper relationship in prayer. Whenever you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners so that they may be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. But whenever you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. When you are praying, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Pray then in this way. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also forgive our debtors. And do not bring us to the time of trial, but rescue us from the evil one. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Thanks be to God, for this is holy word. Amen. So I get to do a couple things that they usually don't let me do around the church much. Colette and Wes have called me forward in Alpha, and I get to start Alpha with a couple jokes. I've missed this, man. It's been about seven years, eight years since I've done that. I, actually, I tried to pick up this microphone since Cindy was gone, and I thought I might sing with the band today. Tell jokes, sing with the band. It would be a good day, right? Okay, don't answer that. <laughs> so I started Alpha this week with this joke, okay? Maybe you've heard it before, but it's um, about the atheist in the woods. And the atheist is uh, walking through the woods and says, wow, this is amazing. It's just beautiful the way this has all evolved. The beauty of the trees, the forests, the glades, the birds, the bees, the animals. When suddenly, from behind a bush, comes a grizzly bear, teeth barred, fangs ready. The atheist goes, God, help me! And suddenly the scene stops, all right? Like one of those movies where suddenly you hear the music and a light drops from heaven upon this scared man. And a voice from heaven says, really? Really, all your life you've denied me and now in this moment of trouble you cry out to heaven? The atheist goes, you're right. That really is unfair. It really is unfair. Don't make me a believer here today, but could you do me one favor? I just pray that you make that bear over there a good Christian bear. <laughs> the heavens close up. The scene starts again. The bear drops to his knees and says, Lord, I thank you for this meal I'm about. <laughs> You've created a monster, Colette. You've created a monster. Do bears pray in the woods? I don't know. But it's interesting, and as Nicky Gumbel opened up his talk on prayer, he talked about the truth that people pray. You've heard it said, there's no atheist in a foxhole, that in foxhole, atheists pray, or when bears are bearing down on you, atheists may pray. But the statistics that Gallup plays out reveal that, that nine out of 10 people in a week say they will pray. Three out of four people responding to the Gallup survey said they pray 
daily. People pray. People pray. Even people who don't believe in God may have some sense of a higher power or spirit. People pray. I knew that through Andrew's accident. Uh, uh, people would, would reach out to us and they would say, I'm praying for you. And these were people who I knew were not people of faith, but I believed that they were praying. And I didn't say, wait a second, come on. Do you really, who are you praying to? What are you, I said, thank you. Thank you. And I know it can be a Christian cliche sometimes when you hear people say they feel supported by prayer. But I can say truthfully, truthfully, those prayers made a difference in our life and in our journey. It was powerful. Prayer is powerful. And, and the world is praying those Nigerian girls, you know, bring back our girls. Is that a prayer we're praying? Some are saying pray for our girls, but bring back our girls is an invitation to heaven. In the Supreme Court, you saw that decision that said, we can pray an invocation before a, a public meeting. And it can be a prayer that names the name of Christ that is particular in certain ways because the Supreme Court recognizes that prayer is a part of our life in some way, in some shape. The fourth week of Alpha was a powerful week in our group. I, I hope it was in, in yours too, but we ended in, in just ways that have touched my life forever. And, and today I'd like to just pivot off of what Nikki Gumbel said in that talk and, and look deeper into, into Matthew 6 and the beauty of this simple prayer, the Lord's Prayer, and talk about that. Today as we look at that, there are just two things I want to look at, and I may confuse you with three other things, but hold on here for a second. I, I just want to talk about the purpose of prayer, and then I think Jesus gives a pattern of prayer. Uh, but, I, but I'd be remiss if I, if I didn't talk about where we've been for the last three days, up on the mountaintop at Hunter with, with uh, we call it Ritter, but uh, Colette was saying that, you know, for some people that name itself seems to be a barrier, but it's, it, it's a process that we're working with of personal and congregational transformation. And we say that the model of discipleship in Ritter revolves around these three areas of work in our lives. A reflective lifestyle, authentic community, and missional living. Okay, so I'm talking about two things, but I want you to view it through those lens. So I'll be referencing those things. I don't expect you to remember those three things today. And Leslie, you always write stuff down. So, and she comes up to me afterwards and she said, what was your third thing there? So it's reflective lifestyle, okay? <laughs> Authentic community and missional living. I got that wrong? Radical obedience is part of a reflective lifestyle. See, there's still things we're learning. So <laughs> radical obedience and that. So we'll talk about that. That's still, I, I, I looked, at, looked at that because I had that same issue. So what was number three? See, she's asking me so I can tell her right now. Missional living. Okay, you got them? Okay, I can go on. Good. The purpose of prayer. I can say this in one word. And that word is relationship, okay? Relationship. That may not be new to you or it may be surprising because most of us think of prayer as petition, right? The things we bring to God. But prayer is, is primarily about relationship. And as you see the Lord's Prayer as Jesus prays it, it's, it's relationship. He starts with others, relationship with God, and relationship with ourselves. That's the reflective living and the radical obedience, relationship with ourselves. So uh, I want to start by saying that, that Jesus says, our Father. It may not be the way you start your prayers. You may start your prayer with my Father or Father in heaven. But Jesus starts with our 
Father. This isn't just a prayer for myself. This is a prayer that's established relationship with others. We start there by saying, our Father. And then Jesus speaks about the relationship of the community together as he closes by saying, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And then in the only kind of additional commentary on the prayer, he says, for if you do not forgive the sins of others, your Father in heaven will not forgive your sins. Jesus is talking about the way that we relate to each other. So prayer, as Jesus sets it up, is about relationship in community with each other, forgiving one another and being forgiven, recognizing that we're in this together. We may pray in private, but we are praying together, our Father. Prayer draws us into relationship with the others, but most of all, it draws us into relationship with God, our Father. Stephanie, thank you for that softball lob pitch that leads right into that word Abba. Because what Jesus is doing when he says our Father in heaven is something that his disciples would have been shocked by. It was not a Hebrew term for God to say Abba, to speak so personally and, and, and comfortably with that word daddy. Daddy, the, the, the first babbling word. That's why we say nana, because it's not that Germans speak different than English folks. It's that every culture has those first words that babies start to speak as the words for mama, dada, nana, and I don't know, some of you do weird, boo-boo, ba-ba, but you know, I mean, but it's still the same thing, a variation on the theme. You're taking some of those early words that children speak. Isn't that a beautiful picture of the intimacy that we're invited into with God? And, and, and it reflects the, the primary purpose, the reason to pray, is because Jesus did it. You read through the Gospels, and again and again, the Gospels say he withdraw to a deserted place to pray. That as ministry poured out of Jesus, he knew that he needed to retreat to be in that relationship with Daddy. And, and you see this cycle of, of Jesus' prayer that goes into the quiet place and out into ministry. Abba, Father, who art in heaven. <laughs> this, this is so powerful that the God we pray to, the God that we can call Daddy, is the creator that fashioned the heavens and the earth. And we, we talked about this some last week. And, and I, can't, I can't imprint faith on you with a few words but you know his name when you walk out in the, in, under a night sky and you see the billions of stars in heaven. And maybe for the atheist in the woods, he looks up at those stars and he just says, that tells me I'm nothing but a tiny little speck. But for those who know Abba, you walk out and you see those stars and you say, it's a miracle beyond my comprehension that the God who created, hallowed be thy name, who art in heaven, is the one that I can call daddy and hears my prayer. And finally, prayer is about relationship with ourselves. And, and maybe this is the hardest part and the part we haven't paid attention to much. But when we come into the quiet, we come into the stillness, Jesus said, you're going to recognize that there's some, some sins about you that you need to be at, pay attention to. Colette and I will sort this out, but this is what reflective lifestyle is about or radical obedience. There are some places that in Ritter language we talk about deliberate disobedience. Is that right? Okay. I think that's right, right? Deliberate, intentional disobedience. We have places 
in our life that we recognize that we are falling short of the glory of God. And, and we've said, actually, I'm, I'm willing to do that. I'm just going to live my life this way, and I know what God's Word says, but actually, this is the way I'm going to live it out. Prayer invites us to get real with ourselves. A searching moral inventory of our lives. And as we do that, Jesus says it again. Earlier he talks about if you're going to the altar and you remember that your brother or your sister has something against you, (laughs) which is interesting. It's not that you have something um, against them. It's that they have something against you. Go set those things right. And this is authentic community. You know, is, is, is taking that... Not to say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say the wrongs against that other person to my friend or my neighbor. That's called gossip. I'm going to complain against them. But the invitation is to reflect on our lives and to be able to go and ask for forgiveness. In the quiet of this moment, there anybody you need to talk to? You spend time in relationship with God, it will affect your relationship with others. I'm recognizing now the importance of communication, of prayer and relationship like I never have before. On the simple level, my wife is living in Michigan. And we're both, I mean, I don't like talking on the phone. I don't think she likes talking on the phone. So we can have some days where we're just not communicating with each other, and that gets tough. I mean, simply it gets tough in this way. I was thinking she was coming home this Wednesday. She said to me, I'm coming home the last weekend in May. I'm a preacher, so the last weekend in May doesn't include June 1st, because June 1st is a Sunday, so I'm thinking that's the first weekend of June. So we've been communicating back and forth about their trip out here, And yesterday, she said, you realize we're not coming this Wednesday, we're coming next Wednesday. I'm like, oh, no. (laughs) But on a simple level, that reflects the deeper level of trying to keep those communication lines open on the phone. The intentionality, if we we just come together and say, "Uh, dear, uh, we need something for health insurance, you got to fill out this thing from Wappinger Central Schools, please do that before. Could you put some money in the checking account so I can withdraw money here? Can can you get some food to me so I'm not starving here? If we're just doing that, we're in trouble. But we have to intentionally, intentionally keep that communication channel open. If there's any hope, of going through this season of distance, staying communicated. My friends, that's the same thing with God. If we're talking about relationship, this isn't something that you wind up when you're in trouble and say, oh, you know, i got to get this communication going quickly. It's something that you live into every day. And as you do it each and every day, that relationship starts to go to deeper and deeper levels. So, I mean, when you think about it, Jesus spent all night praying, how many of us could do that right now? I mean, just, just the call. Spend all night praying. Uh, it's funny. Adam, can I pick on you today? I, I do this all the time, you know. But Adam, when we started this prayer thing in here, he said, like, what do you pray for for an hour? You know, how, you really sit in there for an hour? And, I, I wasn't sitting in there, but right? You asked me that question. He said, what do people do in there for an hour. Well, I'm glad to say, Adam, you're one of our prayers now, right? Yeah. Uh-uh. And how'd it go? Did you pray for an hour? Okay. <laughs> okay. But the point is this, he did. if I asked him to pray all night, if I asked him to pray all night, you might say, whew, how am I going to do that? But when you understand that it's about relationship, do I have any trouble of saying, Kathy, we're going to be together all day and all night. I'm looking forward to that with every ounce of my being and disappointed when I hear it's not going to be this Wednesday, but it's going to be next Wednesday. 
So that's the invitation that we're drawn into, an invitation to to relationship with ourselves, relationship with God, and relationship with others. And the pattern of prayer that Jesus gives us, I I think you can hold on to as as a simple pattern that is profoundly beautiful. And I'm going to pick on somebody else. Boy, I'm really doing it today. You know, but Mike Reynolds, Mike Reynolds always says, I was you, 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 you say, <laughs> but you always say we should pray, thy will be done. All right? So this is in the Father's will that I, I speak about it. Mike always says, why do we have any more prayer than thy will be done? And, and the Lord's prayer really starts with establishing God's graciousness and goodness by saying, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And truly, truly, the prayer could stop there when you understand the nature of the God of heaven. You could stop there and just say, that's, that's all I need is to trust your will. And, and it's a prayer that reflects what we believe about the sovereignty of God, that God is, is, is and it says this in Romans, that the Spirit intercedes with words too deep too deep, words that we can't even come up with. And the Father in heaven knows what we need before we even ask it. So we need to trust the goodness and graciousness of a father's will, just as that's such a challenge for a kid to do as well, right? I want this, and the response of the Father in gracious goodness says, this is what I will provide. So, so we can stop there if we wish, but the God of heaven invites us to lift up our petitions. Give us this day our daily bread. Martin Luther said, this is everything that you need. This this isn't just about food for the day. This is provision for the day. Whatever you may need. I need, Lord, the strength to get through this day. I pray when I run, Jesus, keep me going. Keep me going. Whatever it is that you need in that moment, in that day. Now, it may not be that as Janis Joplin prays, Oh, Lord, won't you buy me a Mercedes Benz? Do you have that song, Tony? But it certainly may be, God, I don't have transportation to get to work. Is there some way that that can be provided? That's daily bread. That's the invitation that's given to us because we're invited into the throne room, as it says in Hebrews, of the one who is the creator of heaven and earth. Nikki Gumbel gives a great illustration of this if you are watching uh, Gumbel's video. I loved it because um, there was a soldier in the Civil War that apparently his brothers had died in the war and there was an exemption that his mom said, you go and talk in Washington. You go talk to the president because she didn't want her last son going into the war. So the soldier came and was kept out of the White House, couldn't get to see the president. Sitting in the park outside of the White House, he was in tears. And this young boy came by and spoke with him and said, what's going on? And, and, the, and the soldier shared the story of all that had happened to his family. And the young boy grabbed him by the arm and said, come with me. And they walked into the White House, through the halls of the White House, into the Oval Office where President Lincoln was talking to William Seward, the Secretary of State. And as soon as the boy and the soldier walked in, Abraham Lincoln stopped and said, Yes, Todd, what is it? And he said, Dad, you need to talk to this guy. He needs your help. And Lincoln provided what the soldier needed. And he was given access through the Son into the throne room of the Father. It's the same thing that the, he- the book of Hebrews tells us, that we have access. We can approach boldly God's throne of grace because we have a high priest, Jesus Christ, who knows what we struggle with, who knows our daily needs. We've already touched on, on that next portion, forgive us our sins. I've, I've spoken about that But the challenge to to seriously take a moral inventory is a challenge that that all of us have trouble dealing with. I don't really want to pick on Donald Sterling again. 
But I will, because he kind of picks on himself. Donald Sterling, the owner of the L.A. Clippers. Did you see his confession this week? His confession. He went on CNN um, with, uh, who's the guy on CNN? Anderson Cooper, yeah. And he shared his confession. And listen to this confession. I don't think this guy has truly taken a serious moral inventory. He said, if I said anything wrong, I'm sorry. Have you ever had a spouse say that to you? If I did anything wrong, I'm sorry. No. Tell me what you may have done wrong. And then he starts talking about Magic Johnson. Who he wronged? He said, he's a good person. I mean, what am I going to say? Has he done everything he can do to help minorities? I don't think so. But I'll say it. He's great. But I don't think he's a good example for the children of Los Angeles. I mean, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. It's an invitation for us to look seriously at the ways that we've fallen short, to start right there and to say, this is what I've done. I repent. And then set it right with Magic Johnson or whomever else it may be instead of taking another slam on that person. But it's an invitation to use this pattern of prayer to look deep within ourselves. Lead us not into temptation. Let me be clear. God, God doesn't tempt us, but we know that we are tempted. To be aware, again, of what tempts us, what keeps us from radical obedience to the ways of Christ. You know what it is right now, don't you? I mean, traditionally, the monastic vows have been to tied together with money, sex, or power. Those three things, in some way, are those things that draw us away from God and tend to black holes that destroy us. Lead us not into temptation. Again, it's inviting you to live a reflective life that knows and is aware. You've heard me say this before, but, but my temptation is not internet pornography. You know? And I've talked to Randy Prentice about this, and we've had good conversations about this. So if you're going to take my history trail on my computer, you're not going to find pornographic websites. That makes you feel good, right? You know. But what you will find is a whole bunch of financial websites, especially one, Fidelity. Fidelity, where my investments are kept. And I'll click on Fidelity. And away I'll go into that temptation that takes me down a black hole. Well, I say this about Randy because I love it. Because Randy said, you know, if our pastor was going to pornographic websites five times a day, we'd say we've got some trouble. But if our pastor is going to financial websites five times a day, nobody's going to get upset about that. But his point was, you should. <laughs> You should. It's a temptation that's there for me that I need to recognize. So every time I'm tempted, as funny as it sounds, it's not funny though, to go to that Fidelity website, I need to say, God, lead me not into temptation. I don't know what it is for you, but do some reflective living to understand what is the temptation that takes you down into that sinkhole and deliver us from evil. Oh, man. That's a prayer we're praying, right? I mean, when you see a hundred girls kidnapped, you're saying, that is just raw, unadulterated evil. Deliver us, God. Deliver us. And that prayer has, has all the power of, uh, of the rangers coming in. That has, prayer has all the power of saying, the last word is not going to be the word of the devil. We're assured of that through the cross. It's not going to be the power of evil. We're assured of that with the victory that was won on the cross. So there it is, a pattern that Jesus encourages you to pray, and not just to go through it quickly by rote, but remember that at its depth, that it's about relationship. That's the purpose of prayer, and it's about a pattern that takes us deeper into ourselves, that takes us deeper into community, and calls us to live faithfully into the will of God 
that missional living that each of us is called to. Wednesday night was beautiful because there was a temptation at the start to say, this guy's the professional prayer, the guy that stands on the street corner and prays for everybody to see. In fact, Bill, you said, I don't pray like Taylor does. No, you were comparing me with somebody else that prayed at Love, Inc., right? Now, she was a good prayer. She was a good prayer. Not as good as Taylor, but she was a good prayer. But the point here is not to be a professional prayer. And I stepped back in the meeting of that room, and we had some very honest and real things shared in that room. And what was so beautiful was I saw the people in our group standing up, putting hands on others, and praying. I saw the relationship between us in that room. I saw the relationship with God, our Heavenly Father, and I saw the relationship of people sharing the deepest things, the deepest hurts that are going on in their lives. Do bears pray in the woods? I don't know. But we need to be praying in our lives. Let's do it. Lord, I stand up here as a professional prayer today and recognize that you call each of us into our closets to be in relationship with you, to pray in secret to our Father who hears in secret. So I pray that in whatever way this message can, can be drilled down into our lives in a deeper way, that you take it and you use it for your purpose and for your glory, and that from this day forward, Lord, relationships here will go deeper with you, deeper with others, and deeper into ourselves. We pray this all in the name of Jesus. Amen.